uh, past webinars about past webinars that we've been um, hosting. I'd like to thank all of our panelists today, Kaya Peterson, Montana James, and Andy Clark. I'd also like to shout out to Nikki Robb, who is our host for today. Uh, she is the program manager for the Missoula Community Foundation. Um, we, the way today will work, we will have a short introduction from each one of our panelists then about 40 to 50 minutes of content, followed by 15 minutes of questions. Those questions, that section will start at noon. So during the webinar, if you have questions, please use the chat feature. Nikki, Rob, and I will be monitoring those questions to save for later on. Um, now I'd like to introduce Kaya Peterson. She is the Executive Director of NeighborWorks Montana. Kaya? Hello, everyone. Thanks so much, Terry. As Terry said, I'm Kaya Peterson. I have a cat in the background, so you may hear some little yowls. It's not a baby. Um, thank you so much to the Women's Giving Circle for, first of all, for choosing housing and homelessness as your priority for giving this year. Um, and secondly, for inviting all of us and, and becoming more informed philanthropists. We know housing and homelessness is such a huge topic. It can be really overwhelming to understand what's going on and where the opportunities are for making some positive impact. And we hope we'll be able to um, help bring, bring some more understanding and opportunity to the conversation today. So as Trey said, I'm the executive director of NeighborWorks Montana. I live in Missoula, been here for 14 years. I've been um, working in the housing sector for eight years. And as the director of this organization, for two years, um, and we do a lot of work on home ownership, but also um, lending and finance, and also um, preservation of manufactured home parks. So I'm gonna be facilitating the conversation with Andy and Montana and sharing some of my perspective along the way as well. So let's meet Montana and Andy. Montana, why don't you start with introducing yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kaya. And, um... As Kaya said, thank you all for having us here today to talk about this. Um, I am Montana James. I'm the Deputy Director in the Community Development Division at the City of Missoula. And as some quick background, I, I grew up here in Missoula. Um, I get that question a lot. Where did my name come from? So I do have that connection. I was born in Montana. Um, and, you know, I, I have heard about high cost of living and housing prices really for as long as I can remember growing up here in Missoula. Uh, but I know um, we've all experienced that in a, to an extreme over the last few years. So I'm really excited to talk with you all more about that. Um, my division is in the larger community planning development and innovation department at the city of Missoula. And so in our, our department, we kind of tackle two, two sides of the issue. Um, our development services division is responsible for, um, for sort of the, the permitting land use compliance and code side of things. And then my division and community development works on policies, programs, and initiatives uh, related to housing and houselessness in the community. Thanks for having me here today. Go ahead, so, Andy, jump right in. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me. It's really a privilege to be um, here. I was actually hoping here would be in Missoula, but I'm currently in my home in Boise. Um, I'm Andy Clark with the Pacific Companies. We are a uh, affordable housing development and construction company based in Boise, and we develop housing all over the West. Um, proudly, we're one of the largest producers of affordable housing in the country, um, and we feel really fortunate to be able to um, make our living every day helping put roofs over people's head who need them most. Um, we're working in partnership with the city of Boise right now on solving their um, comprehensive, comprehensive housing crisis. It's really a challenge here as it is there, and um, we're working on all kinds of innovations to be able to end family homelessness. I serve as the co-chair of the Campaign to End Family Homelessness here in the Treasure Valley. And I'm also a longtime member of the Idaho Women's Charitable Foundation. And we're about a 400 plus member collective women's giving circle. And we give about um, 150 to $200,000 a year throughout Southwest Idaho. So it's really fun to see this event and see that this is something that your women's giving circle has chosen. Um, I lived, worked and played in Missoula for throughout the 90s. 
And I think when I left, um, I put left half my heart and soul there. So every time I get to visit, it's like coming home. And I think um, my love of the mountains has really caused me to focus on really housing and homelessness in high cost areas and mountain resort communities. I've worked in Jackson, Tahoe, Truckee, Mammoth Lakes, and really working on very unique um, housing and homelessness problems so that surround these mountain resort communities that have such amazing natural resources that need to be preserved. So I'm really excited to be here today and looking forward to this conversation. Wonderful, thank you. It'd be excellent to have this very local and this broader Western perspective in today's conversation. So we wanted to start with a little bit of setting the stage because when we say the words affordable housing, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So we just want to start with each of you sharing how you define affordable housing. So let's start with um, Montana and then we'll go to Andy on this one. Yeah, thanks Kaya. I, you know, in our in our division at the city, we operate within um, several different federal funding programs through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So we get really deep in some very bureaucratic definitions of affordable housing and income and limits that are imposed. Um, you know, I think some of the the best indicators or definitions that we like to use at a broader sense, though, um, one relies on area median income, which is a, an indicator that HUD uses, which essentially is just trying to say, you know, what is the, the average income in a community? And from that, what what is an affordable housing price based on that income? But at the, the kind of core level, what's considered affordable is um, up to 30% of any individual or, or household income spent on housing costs tends to be the kind of benchmark of what is considered affordable. I think kind of at a fundamental level, though, the, the reason that matters and the reason that we as a community care about affordable housing is because we know that um, if you're spending more than 30%, um, or in a lot of cases in Missoula, 40, 50% of your income on housing, that's less money you have to spend on, on other things, on, um, on healthcare and education and all of the other things that help us live a really high quality of life. So um, I think kind of any conversation about affordable housing has to consider the purpose of that exercise and to acknowledge that when people pay more that they're paying less in other areas of their lives. And I, I mean, it's exactly, um, I think a universal definition is, you know, really what are the consequences of overpayment for housing, whether it's for a mortgage or for rent there are severe consequences to overpayment. And that usually comes in the first and foremost in the forms of food. And when you're talking about families and children, where's that food coming from? Because, oh, well, our first resource is, okay, well, we might not be able to afford that today because I still need my car to be able to get to my job. You still have to go to school. We still have to have shoes on our feet. So like food banks end up being the first line of defense. And so really it's looking at what are the consequences of that overpayment when there's been so many resources out there that says really 30% of your income towards housing allows regular spending um, or on a, in a budgeted household to be able to um, make all your other life functions work. Such a great way to ground the conversation. We talk a lot at our organization too about um, food being one of those first things and then the other being medicine and healthcare. So that that real strong link between or among housing, food and health and how essential all three are as um, fundamental aspects of our quality of life and opportunity. I would just add, you know, for us, we define it as creating an opportunity for affordable homes for everyone in our state and in our communities. And what that means is we hope that the private sector will be able to serve as many people as possible, but we know that there are a lot of people who are left out of that um, sector and increasing number of folks who, who can't access housing through, through a private market without support. And so that's where government and nonprofits and, and others of us come in to try to fill some of those needs. So I think a lot of the conversation today, you'll be hearing of us talking about those folks who, um, how we serve people who aren't otherwise being served. So now the why. 
again, we talked, we started by saying this is complex and it can be hard to understand. And I think we have a lot of people looking at the current housing dynamics and the rapid pace of change we're experiencing in our community. And they're asking why, you know, why are prices increasing so dramatically, so quickly? What, what are, what's causing our current situation? So we want to try to dig into that a little bit and um, understand the, from Montana and Andy's perspective. How do you answer that question? What are the most important dynamics that are at play that we want to make sure people understand as um, foundational parts of the conversation? So Andy, why don't you kick us off with this one? So um, there are, it's an incredibly complex issue right now, but one of the things that I haven't, that you don't often hear in regular conversation, right? We're so immersed in our COVID dilemma <laughs> and trying to dig ourselves out of that. I think we forget that um, we had the great recession and a lot of people lost their homes and there were a lot of builders and contractors that lost their businesses and their livelihood. And so we saw the, the least amount of ho new home construction post great recession. So we are digging ourselves out of a hole. And a lot of those contractors and builders maybe took other professions, they were retrained. There was a lot of retraining money that came from the government at that time and took people out of those trades because the housing market was the problem. So um, a lot of people have been re re very reluctant to re-enter the market, um, rightly so, very nervous. And so we're really digging ourselves out of that problem and then COVID hit. And so it really is truly a supply and demand problem. We were behind on supply first and then COVID hits and we have um, many of our urban areas shut down construction. Um, anything that was not essential, um, a lot of co contractors were not allowed to show up on the job. And so that supply and demand of just the actual building of the homes is one factor. And then we have um, high income earning families who have the mobility to say, I can work from anywhere. And places like Missoula and Boise um, are high on the list, Bozeman, very high on the list of places, desirable places to live and raise your family and work from anywhere. So that changing demographic, and I've heard um, economists talk about it as like the great reshuffling. And there's never been a migration amongst our population like they're seeing now. So not only in places like Boise and Missoula, but Austin, Texas, everywhere, people are seeing buyers, about half the buyers are coming from outside. So it's not a unique problem. And so we have this real um, demand problem and desirable places where people are going to use, and we're still digging our house self out of the supply. And then um, one of the other factors I hear about a lot is millennials who previously did not have income to be able to think about buying a home until recently. And so they're entering the marketplace now with the most savings they've ever had, because as a country, we saved more over COVID than ever before. So people have cash in hand. They didn't have to go to work. They, you know, everything got ordered online. Everyone's disposable income started to go into the savings account. And so there's now a cash influx also. So you bring all of those things together and it's a perfect storm for a complete disaster, let alone all of the increases in um, actual building materials. And then the labor shortage, which depending on who you talk to is, you know, maybe people chose to reevaluate their life and move to go live with their parents and take care of them through their old age, or maybe they're just don't like their job anymore and decided to go back to school during COVID. So I think it was a real, moment in our country where we started to really rethink about our priorities and how we spend our time and how we work and who we spend our time with. And um, I'm really hopeful that maybe things will stabilize uh, pretty soon. And I think people are saying that the supply side might catch up in the next 14 months. So, um, but we're in a very critical period now. And although it's easy to say, okay, we might dig ourselves out and be in a plateau in the next 14 months, that doesn't matter to someone who is barely making their rent payments, whose landlord is flipping their unit to an Airbnb because they can make more money and they don't have a place to go. So it's really looking at those short-term solutions for a long-term problem. Like how do we deal with the people that are really struggling right now while we're hopeful that we can solve it on the long-term? Fantastic context. Um, hard, hard larger market forces here. Montana, what would you add yeah. to that? Yeah, I, I think a lot of what Andy said sort of summarizes the, the sort of ecosystem of the housing market. And that's something that we think about a lot. Um, it's not a, a linear market um, 
all of these micro decisions have lots of ripple effects at the individual level, um, at the uh, organization level. And that's a lot of what we <laughs> spend our time thinking about and, and trying to figure out what our decision space is at the, the local government level and the municipal level. And I, I think we kind of think of think of the issue as sort of threefold. I think there's the, the economic forces at play. A lot of what Andy talked about, um, housing markets relative to other economic goods can be the, the kind of finding that equilibrium point can be really hard because it, it's a market that relies entirely on land, which is really finite, especially in communities like Missoula, where we have, and, and Andy spoke to this earlier, we have a lot of natural resources that we're protecting and that we love and provide a really high quality of life. We're limited in land through mountains and rivers and the geographic reality of where we are. Um, so that restricts and, and limits naturally where we can build homes. Um, I think the demand side of it is also really complicated, um, which is something else Andy spoke to of um, kind of all of the, the individual decisions that go into kind of who who's able to think about purchasing a house, um, pricing, mortgages, interest rates, all of that makes it really complicated. I think the, the second piece that that we think about a lot are the policy forces at play. And that's something kind of from the macro level in, in the US, the federal government and local governments have been making policy decisions that affect housing markets for hundreds of years. <laughs> and then we see those, uh, the implications at the local level. And I think where this is especially impactful is when um, things like federal policies maybe clash with local policies. Um, when the federal government uh, has policies that are intended to spur market demand with things like the mortgage interest tax deduction and lower interest rates, that can really clash with local policy decisions that are essentially intended to um, restrict market supply. And that's something we've seen for many decades in terms of just our zoning policies and how we look at land use in our communities and single family zoning and, and all of those individual policy decisions that happen at the local level. So I think kind of mapping out the all of the policy forces at play is, is something else that helps kind of tell the story of how we have gotten to where we are today. And then lastly, I, I think the local conditions are, are also really important to consider. Um, Andy spoke to the kind of impacts of that, the Great Recession and how we're, we've been playing catch up ever since and we really have not caught up in Missoula, especially I know a lot of our construction trades, we, we lost a lot of that labor and the firms that were in that space to other, other places, the Bakken oil boom and some of those um, other economic opportunities that we really just have not recovered from. So um, that in addition to sort of the scarcity of developable land um, and of course the, the pandemic and the impact that has had on our market as, as folks are, I think twofold as, as some people were, were moving and choosing to, to move here, work remotely, et cetera, but also as many people chose not to move during the last year and a half because it didn't feel safe to, to list your house, to sell it, or um, you know, to move from one rental unit to another. That really limited the, the residential mobility that we saw in our market, and, and that has had an impact as well. So many pieces here that you all have hit on, and I think that those underlying economic factors, those demographic and migration um, elements, the issues that you hit on Montana around the regulatory environment, you, know, you can't just go get a homestead interest and throw a cabin up. Um, you, there's a lot of regulations and many for very good reason. Um, we have a very different environment now than we did before, but it also creates cost and creates complexity and creates risk. Um, but one other thing I would add to this piece of the conversation is changing environment around government spending. So when we're talking about serving very low income folks and people who aren't otherwise gonna be served, you know, there's been a significant decrease in funds for rental assistance and other programs over the years while costs have been going up. So our ability to serve um, more people is really limited by some of those government um, programs and government funding. And we're seeing some of that really called into question right now um, through the American Rescue Plan 
and also through the current federal administration. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out and um, some of the new the new ways that funding flows to people who aren't otherwise being served. Okay. So we've started to set the stage here. We know housing is a challenge across a variety of housing types and a variety of situations. And so we're thinking about that today in three general categories from homelessness to rental to home ownership. And so we're gonna take each one in turn and we're gonna start with home ownership. So we've talked a little bit about the rising costs and we know that home ownership is becoming further and further out of reach for people in our communities as those millennials have that cash Andy talked about and they have interest in becoming homeowners, that demand is there, um, but the cost is really high. So as, and the other thing I think is important to understand or remember about home ownership is it um, really still is the largest source of asset and wealth building opportunities, particularly for low and middle income families in the US. So it continues to be um, a, a key opportunity for um, moving the needle on intergenerational poverty and giving people opportunity to um, have financial st stability and to advance in other aspects of their and thrive in other aspects of their lives as well. So um, in this environment, in this context, is the American dream of homeownership dying? What opportunities are there to keep homeownership in reach? Let's start with Montana. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, you know, I, I thinking more about this, I don't know that the, the dream of home, home ownership is dying, but I do think the model of home ownership from the 20th century is, is not sustainable and, and in a lot of ways not desirable anymore. Um, and just from a consumer perspective, you know, I, I, mentioned that I grew up here in Missoula and, and the conversation about cost of living and housing cost was one that, that I heard a lot in my household. And for my parents um, and many people that they knew, the, they sort of moved outside of town in order to be able to fulfill that dream of, of home ownership. They had to kind of travel to, to where they qualified. Um, and I, I think now talking to a lot of people um, my age and in friend groups, um, that trade-off of sort of traveling to where you qualify is not necessarily the most attractive anymore. Um, I think different generations prioritize different things. I think the reality of climate change and trying to to make decisions to to mitigate the the impacts of climate change on an individual basis is something that comes up a lot to um, to want to be able to be close enough to to walk to things or ride the bus i think all of those things factor in but uh but even that privilege to <laughs> to be able to think about what the what your trade-offs that you're willing to make are and um, kind of where you wanna live. That's something at a fundamental level that fewer and fewer people in Missoula uh, have the luxury of making. And I think that's part of why that we're having this conversation today. You know, the, the median home price is in a place where not many of our residents can, can reach that um, regardless of, of whether you kind of travel outwards or, choose a smaller house size or older, or whatever those trade-offs are, it's just not possible. Um, so I think we have to really think differently about what home ownership means and, and the models out there. And, and some of the things that we've been thinking about at, at the city level and working on are, you know, things like cooperative models, community land trust models, um, just different ways to get at home ownership and, and make it more affordable. And Kaya, you, you talked about sort of federal resources and the shifts that we've seen in those programs over time. But really through our federal funding programs up to this point, we still um, are restricted in sort of who we can serve. And, and there's a mismatch there uh, in terms of program beneficiaries and what the reality of the market is and what's accessible to our residents. So I think expanding types of home ownership and our kind of ideas or conceptions of what that homeownership dream looks like is going to be really important. Um, 
and but to that same point, kind of through our own local affordable housing trust fund and our own housing policies, we've also really focused on expanding that that beneficiary pool and thinking differently about um, what kind of subsidy we provide and what kind of restrictions are on the subsidy. Sort of going up to 120% area median income is the need right now for home ownership programs, whereas in the past it's been limited to 80% um, by federal programs, uh, um, and that's just not not really the match anymore. Yeah, and we've definitely seen that at NeighborWorks Montana as well. We run down payment assistance programs, and historically we were able to help a lot of folks at that 80% area median income get into home ownership, but that that gap between their income and the price of homes is growing. And like you said, a lot of the, the programs that are out there don't um, meet the need of folks above 80%. But down payment assistance is still one really fantastic proven um, avenue to home ownership for a lot of folks. And you know, Montana, you mentioned community land trusts and cooperatives. I would say for folks on the call, if there are if you want to dive more into any of those models, those would be great questions to save for later in the conversation, depending on your interests. Andy, what would you have to add in terms of home ownership needs and opportunities? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, a lot of people, um, it's not just about growing wealth and having that home ownership opportunity and that pride of ownership, but I think in places like Missoula, there's this desire to keep a sense of community. And if all of our homes have been turned into um, short-term rentals or even long-term rentals to students who may not continue to reinvest in the community, it's like, how do we make, dig those roots and preserve the community and the why everyone loves Missoula so much? And I think homeownership is often viewed as that, as, as a place to start. And so we don't want to push the people who wanna invest in the community out to the outlying areas. They still want to be part of the community, walk to community events downtown, be part of that place that's so special. So really, as Montana was saying, looking at the different models, is it um, you know a townhome, is it condos? And we're also dealing with this at a place where we have a shift in demographics where the interest is so much different. And yeah, I want a place to make sure that I can store my mountain bike and my skis, but I don't necessarily need a front yard. Would a community garden suffice? Yes. So how do we make our housing stock more diverse and look a little bit less like um, it did, you know, 50 years ago? And, um, and a lot of that comes with the hard work that Montana and her team is doing at the city of really looking at zoning. Where can we increase densities for a home ownership opportunity as well as rental markets? And then using that community land trust model, which you have a couple different ones, I believe in Missoula that are investing in a lot of different ways to be able to take the land out of the equation and make these homes more affordable. And as you're looking at your local resources, so as I mentioned, I've worked in very high cost areas. Right now I'm working on a project in Tahoe where we are looking to serve homeowners earning up to 220% of the area median income. So these are families who make almost $200,000 a year. Um, and still cannot provide, you know, buy a home. So you're really looking at, and hopefully Missoula will, will never get there, but it's really an interesting marketplace because you're serving a demographic that you really have to work on, like what's the marketing strategy? What do these people want? Really looking at the demographic and how they want to live and how you can serve them. And really, as you look at your federal funds and the funds that you use, Kaya, and down payment assistance to get up to that 120%, Where's the gap and you know, does Missoula have local money and are there community land trusts that, that um, the Women's Giving Circles and others could help fund to provide that gap between 80 and 120 or 120 and 150 and how much is that? There's a lot of creative ways in doing that. Um, there's a program in Vail called Vail Indeed that um, Placer County in the Tahoe area is mimicking where um, the, uh, the city or the county is using their local funds to pay for a down payment for a home for a family that's income qualified up to maybe 15 or 20 percent for a down payment in exchange for a deed restriction on their property that says i will only ever sell my home to someone who works in the area and that's it's a very simple me measure and it helps get someone into the home and it's not an onerous restriction, it stays there, but at least it preserves your community housing stock for people who are working in your community and investing in your community on a daily basis. So there's a lot of creative things that are happening out there that 
does someone want to live in a deed restricted unit their entire life? No, but it does it provide them with maybe enough equity over time to buy into the open market and help build that wealth? Totally. Um, so on that, I'm going to flip the coin a little bit and say, should we worry about home ownership? <laughs> and there's a lot of arguments out there that basically says on a national level, home ownership is forced savings, right? So shouldn't we be looking on a policy level nationally on how do we help people shift their wealth investment for their future away from their home so that they have the flexibility to move, to sell their home and move into a rental when their lifestyle needs it, to really live more freely rather than constantly having to think about their housing choice as <clears throat> their retirement choice. Um, so that's obviously much bigger picture, much higher level, but I think it's worth considering because we are seeing so many demographic changes, multi-generational housing. It's really a shifting marketplace right now. And I think as a country, we need to think, okay, is really this the best investment for our federal dollars is to help people get into homes so they can build wealth or should we be encouraging broader policies to help build wealth across incomes, race, ethnicity, and really kind of diversify how we um, are accumulating wealth in this country and not just solely relying on our homes to be able to provide that. I'm so glad you brought that up, Andy. I love Marcy saying, this hurts my brain. <laughs> it does, right? And I think there are a lot of other reasons to invest in home ownership beyond wealth and, and asset building, but it, it has historically been a, a core motivator for why home ownership exists. And I think we're seeing some of that shift in our housing counseling. So NeighborWorks Montana works with organizations across the state to provide historically home ownership education and counseling, but increasingly financial capabilities coaching. And part of that shift is about exactly what Andy was talking about, that home ownership isn't right for everyone. We know that. We're at about a 50-50 split in our community right now and nationwide. Um, and it does make people focus on their home as their asset. So a lot of folks, when they're first starting to work on budget and action planning around their financials, they're not thinking about other retirement opportunities. They're not thinking about other types of investment. And we're starting to see a real shift in the coaching community around bringing those um, concepts really more to the more to the fore in those conversations. So thanks for raising that. Okay, let's move on to renters. So as prices rise, buildings are being sold and we current tenants are facing rent increases and sometimes displacement. Um, this I would say has been one of the the places in Missoula where we've seen the most turmoil and the most stress um, in conjunction with COVID impacts, that our renters in our community are really um, among some of the, the most at risk and the most impacted in the current environment. So, and, and the other thing, you know, renters feel that they're stuck without options. If they get displaced, they're unlikely to be able to find something more affordable. Um, we're at a you know, 99% occupancy, very little, very little vacancy, very little opportunity for renting. So what opportunities are there to improve renter stability and choice? Um, what is working and what more could be done? I'm going to start with Montana on this one again, and then Andy, you're going to get the next one first. But Montana, let's hear from you about renters. I was really hoping you would ask Andy first because uh, I want you can pitch it to her. <laughs> no, I can, I'll talk a little bit about it, but you know, this is, I think this is one of the most challenging things about our work right now, especially at the local level and probably one of the most frustrating because renters in, this is something that, that often for us in terms of our decision space and where we can make an impact at a policy level, we have to defer to, to state level law and regulations, and we don't have a lot of space, at least in terms of policy. And that can be really hard and really challenging. Um, you know, our, our state landlord tenant act is what governs the landlord tenant relationship in the state. And it really, in my opinion, um, prioritizes landlord or property rights above the rights of, of renters or tenants. And so renters in Montana do not have access to a lot of the protections that renters in other states do. Um, 
you know, I, I lived in Washington for, for several years and it just was so fundamentally different. And I remember experiencing that as a renter going from renting in Missoula to renting in Seattle, costs were really high and the market was really intense, but just even simple things uh, around policies and restrictions in terms of the security deposit process and, um, and, uh, kind of process around eviction or, or um, disputes at the the tenant landlord relationship were really different. Um, so I think the the intensity of our rental market right now, you mentioned Kaya, we have a below 1% vacancy rate that really exacerbates the issue and really disempowers renters even more. Um, and that that's a challenge that we're seeing and hearing about and trying to solve for every day. And, you know, I, there's been a lot of focus lately on, on eviction and the federal eviction moratorium and, and then how that's shifted over time and the impacts at the local level. But a lot of what we're seeing right now is not actually eviction. It's people getting 30 day notice to vacate who are on month to month leases. And, and there's just there aren't really good policy tools to pr protect folks in that situation. And with the vacancy rate, what it is, there, there's not many places to go. There aren't units available. And that has had a lot of challenges. You know, we've been feeling it a lot in our um, houselessness system and trying to serve our residents who are unhoused. Um, and in the last several months, it's sort of, it's escalated to sort of all, all renters um, are experiencing that frustration. and. Um, and the vulnerability that comes with that. So, you know, I think ideally I would love to see more legal resources for renters um, at, in our community and at the state level, we have some good resources here, but I think that that's um, sort of the informational and, and legal resources will, will be really important. And ultimately we need more rental stock. We need more options. We need to increase that vacancy rate so that we have more homes that people can rent and live in. And that will increase the sort of security of, of renters, I think, in itself, but that's a, a very slow process. Um, and then, you know, ultimately in, in a dream world, I think we do need to look at our state landlord tenant act and, and think a little bit more critically about the trade-offs there and, um, and how we can protect renters in the state. It's definitely a, um, it's a really interesting time. So I'm going to start with the positive um, because I live in almost the reddest of the red. Um, I have gotten a lot of input about um, the federal regulations, about the um, eviction moratoriums and, and rent moratoriums that were put in place for COVID. And um, that, you know, somehow landlords didn't have rights to be able to uh, manage their own properties. And I can say in a really positive way, we own thousands of apartments throughout the West and we got ahead of um, the issue and we had our property managers meeting with our tenants on a payment program. And I, we were incredibly surprised at how many of our residents said, yes, please, this is what I can afford. This is what's happening with my income. I do not want to get behind. I don't want to have to owe all this rent when the law changes. I want to continue to pay my rent and um, be a good resident. And it, it was amazing how the positivity that we got from our residents that wanted to participate in that payment program and to stay in their home and not get behind and to remain in good standing. And it was really a testament to, I don't know, I sort of look at humanity in general. I thought, okay, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about people, right? And to say, um, oh gosh, you're a renter and you all of a sudden don't have to pay rent for the next six months, nine months, that someone would take advantage of that. And that's not at all what we're seeing. And so that's really, really comforting. And it just really gives me so much hope that, you know, people are good stewards of their own money and they want to be good residents. Um, the other thing I'd say from a landlord perspective is um, evictions are horrible. <laughs> No one wants to go through an eviction process. It's costly, it's time consuming, it's exhausting. It doesn't make you feel good. Um, no one wants to do that. And so to the extent that um, Missoula has resources to help people in eviction court, both landlords and residents, we have an organization here in Boise called Jesse Tree. And they have um, legal interns from Boise State that work on our eviction hotline 
and they give classes to landlords about how to avoid evictions which they, they attend which is pretty amazing and they try to intercede whenever possible and they they call the eviction court and get the new filings and they reach out to both the resident and the landlord and try to make some resolution there to prevent that eviction because nobody wants it so if there's any misconception out there that, um, you know, and I know the law, and there are some, <laughs> there are certainly plenty of landlords out there that are horrible. We all know them and have experienced them in our life. But there are some really um, great silver linings out there towards helping people keep in, keep themselves in their home and working um, with landlords who care to be able to keep people in their homes. Um, the other piece is supply. And um, currently, in the legislature, we have the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. Um, it just got attached to the reconciliation bill in the House. And um, for those of you um, not in the affordable housing wonk world, um, the low income housing tax credit is what builds affordable housing throughout our country. It is a primary source of federal funds. And the very basics of it are that um, large corporations are given a tax credit for investing in affordable housing. And um, that gets doled out from the federal government. The federal tax credits are given to the state on a per capita basis. Montana and Idaho, of course, don't get very many state uh, tax credits because we have small populations. So um, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act that's currently working its way through Congress is very well supported on a bipartisan level. We have um, our congressional delegation in um, Idaho supporting it. Um, and it will basically double the amount of federal resources that Idaho and Montana will receive um, to help pr produce affordable housing. It's a supply um, bill. It's not just more services. It's not rental assistance. It's directly towards production, which we know the supply side, as Montana said, is really a huge, huge piece of the problem. And the benefit of actually building affordable housing with those federal resources is the rental rate increases are much lower than you see in the marketplace there's more protections for residents, um, there tends to be a much lower turnover, and um, they're managed better and better maintained for low income residents. So on a supply side, it's not a perfect system, but it was one that was invented um, on a bipartisan shared um, mutual benefit uh, interest under the Reagan administration, and it has really held strong to keep us out of government projects and to produce high quality affordable housing um, for low income families. So that's working its way through Congress right now to help on the supply. Um, and then the other side locally is um, really looking to how um, short term rentals are being managed and what tools you have locally to manage those short term rentals as a desirable community to visit because it is a hot marketplace that people are looking at as a way of shifting their house, their income from their rental. It's like, oh, well, would I rather deal with the couple of people visiting from California or do I want a you know long-term renter in my home so really looking at those regulations and making sure that they're um, located in appropriate places that there's an appropriate number and um, in Idaho we can't regulate them at all <laughs> we're working on that as a policy issue but to the extent that you have that ability it's really a key component in the inventory Thanks, Andy. Yeah, a little local con. Oh, go ahead, Montana. I was going to say that's a great point, Andy. Thank you for saying that. And I didn't know you were not allowed to regulate short term rentals in Idaho. So that makes me feel like we need to move quickly. Here. <laughs> um, and we have um, in Missoula, just so folks know, we do have what's called the tourist home ordinance on the books right now um, that requires registration of short term rentals, um, whole units. So folks who have just a room in their, their house that they're renting, they don't need to register, but um, full units are required to register. And, and we know that the compliance rate with that ordinance is pretty low. Um, so, so through this most recent budget process, we've um, received some funding to really dig into that data and, and try to better understand kind of what's the gap between compliant registered short term rentals and what's really being marketed out there um, and, and start to look at kind of from that data, how do we need to update our ordinance and kind of what is that, that policy conversation at the community level. That's great. Yeah, the, the company that's doing that is called Air DNA, which I thought was a great, great name. <laughs> um, I just wanted to highlight, I think in this conversation, you heard sort of three really critical strategies that span the whole housing spectrum. So one is serving people. 
people have all these different needs related to their housing. So they need rent support, they need eviction prevention, they need legal support. Um, so there's housing services, there's preservation of what we already have. So preserving affordable housing, preserving existing um, naturally occurring affordable housing, like older multifamily apartment buildings, manufactured home parks, um, making sure that those types of housing continue in our community and continue to stay affordable. And then there's that creating new, that supply side. Um, so all three of those are areas that we're all working on. And, and another way that we can think about where is their where is their need and where is their opportunity to create solutions. And then just a couple kind of local notes um, in terms of the legal resources, Montana Legal Services Association serves the state and has, during COVID has really upped their eviction prevention supports and is doing some really interesting things like um, working with the city of Billings on a mediation approach rather than a court-based, you know, um, courtroom-based approach to eviction management and making sure that people have representation. So it's a, if you're interested in that topic, I think they're a great organization to um, learn from. And then with COVID funds, there is emergency rental assistance available. And I just want to make sure everyone is aware that that's there. And um, there's a lot of availability at the state level to make sure that people um, are able to stay in their in their homes in the current in the current market. And then I lastly wanted to note that um, Andy talked a lot about the Credit Improvement Act and how important the federal tax credit program is to developing new affordable housing. The Montana Housing Coalition, which is a statewide advocacy group, is working on a state tax credit. So that's come to the le state legislature at least the last two sessions in a meaningful way um, and continues to be a really key policy advoc advocacy need at the state level, which we think could double the number of affordable units that are being um, created in the state if we have access to both the federal and a state-based um, tax credit, which is available in a lot of other states. So another um, policy piece to be aware of. All right, we're gonna move on to homelessness. And I think we could spend hours talking about any one of these topics. Um, we only have 10 minutes left until we wanna to try to make sure we create some time for Q&A, but we do wanna hear from um, Andy and Montana on homelessness. Both have a lot of experience with this issue. So um, Andy, let's just dive right in and start with you sharing with us about homelessness needs and opportunities. So um, it's such a complex issue and there's so many different dynamics at play. Um, but um, there's, there's all kinds of things that really need to be considered. There's family homelessness, which is often caused by families fleeing domestic violence, um, women and children fleeing domestic violence. And so that um, that's one category. And then we have sort of the um, single person, which is often a misconception that possibly that person wants to live at, um, on the street or they have mental health problems that not to be, need to be solved first before we tackle homelessness. Um, and, um, and those folks really fall into an area that need what's called permanent supportive housing where it's um, housing for individuals who have health and um, medical services on site. And those tend to be um, very expensive um, and ongoing. But we, had, um, we have a permanent supportive housing project here in Boise. It's actually the only one in Idaho. And it serves um, 40 individuals. And in an effort to have our healthcare system and our sheriff's department and the city and all of our partners come together to support that development, um, we had researchers at BSU start to track some numbers. And what we found is over the past three years that that um, permanent supportive housing um, has been helping these 40 individuals stay housed. Um, emergency room visits alone has saved over $3 million a year. So that doesn't count whatever savings the sheriff's department had in interacting with these people, but these are individuals who want to be healthy and, ha and need a, a home first in order to be able to help um, support them in a really positive way. So it was, um, it's really encouraging and we continue to, to track the data to really show that jail visits are down, hospital emergency room visits are down, um, and really that these, it, that type of permanent supportive housing helps these individuals um, stay housed. And then we know that shelter is really a piece of the puzzle. 
um, solving homelessness does not mean that there won't ever be another homeless person on the streets. It means hopefully that that trauma of being homeless will last no more than 60 days and won't be a recurring event because the trauma and the long term homelessness we know is what really um, can be damaging in the long term. And particularly on the family homelessness side, we know that if we can house a family with children, that that is the greatest opportunity to break that cycle of poverty is to keep that child stable in one school where they have good support and support outside of their family. So it's an incredibly complex issue. And I think it's wonderful. I recently read about the family shelter that the um, YWCA opened in Missoula. So good job. That's pretty awesome. It's very, very exciting. Um, and I know that there's a ton of great work going on uh, around homelessness in Missoula. And it's a very complex issue. But looking on a national scale, as, as we launched our campaign to end family homelessness, and this was sort of a um, brainchild of our former mayor and continued by our existing mayor was, um, we were talking about the issue and we said, well, what if we, what if we run this like a capital campaign, but don't build anything? And so we have, um, we're looking at an $8.7 million price tag um, to rehouse our roughly 350 families that are currently unhoused and on a two year waiting list. Um, and we believe with about 8.7 million, we can rehouse these families and then um, really make sure that we're able to provide that rental assistance to um, keep people stable rather than uh, rehousing them. And in talking with people um, who do similar work on the national scale, everyone is incredibly optimistic because of the amount of rental assistance that it's, has been dispersed through COVID and everyone feels like it's really a manageable um, problem that we can put those dollars to work in a really positive way. So for example, um, a lot of those federal dollars go towards um, rental assistance and sometimes those number of those HUD dollars have limits on how much rental assistance can be given. So maybe the, the rent on the apartment is $1,400, but the, the HUD money that comes through can only spend $1,000. So you have a $400 gap. And what we're doing um, on a large scale is looking to property owners and saying, particularly large ones and saying, hey, you own 50 units um, and they're all occupied by people who are paying market value rent. Are you willing to take one or two of those units and rent to someone who is previously homeless and use the HUD dollars and take that $400 gap and just suck it up? <laughs> and we're really surprised at how many people are coming to the table. I mean, and these are, you know, these are not just individuals that have one unit. Obviously, you can't take the hit if you just have, you know, two or three apartments or maybe a duplex that you're renting. But in a large apartment building of, you know, 50 to 100 units, um, we're just asking him to take the haircut and and say, you know what, it's it's time to be part of the solution. And we're really surprised at how many people are coming to the table. So that's been really a, a positive thing. And um, to the extent that, you know, uh, organizations and foundations like the Women's Giving Circle and other um, local foundations and, or, uh, and granting organizations can provide that flexibility, that gap money that's not tied to income or use. Because a lot of times what we're finding as far as preserving people in their existing rental, they might have paid their rent and then their car broke down. So where's the fund to get my car fixed so I can keep my job? And so I think it's really incumbent on, upon us as communities, as nonprofits that really know our localities to provide the, what those funds are. And um, our Boise School District has a really wonderful resource to be able to help with those, some of those emergency funds that are not really tied to um, income or use. They can you know, help with that money to be able to provide the gap for the utility bill so the power doesn't get turned off so they can still make food and things like that. So it's not always just rental assistance, which the government bucket feels really well right now. It's where's, where are the flexible dollars? And that's where I think as communities, we have to get really creative and as nonprofits, we gotta to come together and say, where can we find the flexible money to be able to help keep these people in their homes? Montana, what would you add? Or some, maybe some local yeah. perspective too. Yeah, that was, the, that was really helpful framing, um, Andy. Yeah, I think so locally, I think to Andy's point, our, our our focus over the last several years has been on that sort of what we call housing first model. So trying to build up the inventory of affordable homes in Missoula. And we have some really big projects that are in construction and they're, they're gonna bring inventory online. Um, but over the past, uh, you know, 
year and a half or two years, the extreme pinch that we've felt with COVID and the impacts and the really low vacancy rate, we've had to sort of shift our, our focus back to that, that shelter continuum or what's the spectrum of shelter options that we have available for our residents. Um, because we've seen, uh, you know, the rates of unhoused residents increase uh, over the last year. So, so we've been really focusing on kind of analyzing and developing that continuum of options um, to really just meet folks where they are, whether that's a, a safe camping site where they can can stay in a, in a space that's comfortable for them, but is um, a sanctioned location for that. Um, we have looked at kind of high service temporary housing, specific congregate shelter, non-congregate shelter, and then population specific services, like Andy mentioned, the Meadowlark family housing um, shelter through the YWCA. Um, so really kind of focusing on, on what's the need, what's the, the population that we see right now and how do we meet them where they are and find the right fit for them as we work on building up the inventory of affordable homes that are available for folks. Um, I think in Missoula, we've also really been focusing more on that kind of cross agency collaboration that is really essential to, to do that work of understanding the spectrum of options available. Um, we started the Missoula coordinated entry system several years ago and, and have really been working on building out that infrastructure. And what that means is just kind of bringing all of the service providers together to really look at who in the community is unhoused right now, what are their needs, how do we kind of connect them with the right resources to make sure that we're collaborating and talking um, so that sort of the onus is not on individuals or families to go sort of knock on every door of every agency and say, do I qualify, here's my need, but so that we're collaborating and coordinating and, and can do that work for them. And then, you know, an, another element that, at the city level that we've been working on, especially in the last couple of years, is just improving communication and partnership within our city agencies. So our team um, and community development with the parks department and the police department and code compliance and all of these different city entities that, that experience this uh, or kind of interface with people who are unhoused in the community and making sure that we're coordinating our resources and, and again, kind of making sure we're matching the right resource for that individual. So that's sort of some of the local context um, and happy to answer questions too. Thanks to you both. We're gonna open it up to audience questions and then I may ask a couple of follow-up questions or close this out. So Terry, do you wanna take over Q&A? Let's go to the chat. Um, I think one, one question that I've read about in local media from Missoula residents is if the city does intend to increase access to the temporary uh, safe outdoor spaces, um, where would the, what would that look like? Where would those where would those be? Uh, is that adequate? Is that an adequate response to the the homelessness pro problem that we have and that we see downtown all the time? Yeah, thanks for that question, Terry. Um, you know, I think some of this gets back to what Andy mentioned, which is the experience of being unhoused is is pretty complicated and, and it looks a lot of different ways. You know, the, the very visible homelessness in the community is one specific population. We also have to think about family homelessness and and all of those other elements. And so so that's kind of goes back to that that topic of the the spectrum of, of shelter options. Um, and really trying to connect um, where the gaps are in that continuum of shelter options. So the what's called the temporary safe outdoor space, um, uh, which is down Highway 93 right now, um, currently is a partnership between uh, Missoula County and a private a private landowner and Hope Rescue Mission. And that started out kind of in the last year to just create, again, sort of safe campsites for folks who who need that space but it's also a really service rich environment so um, they've got a lot of different service providers on site healthcare providers and that has been 
a really successful um, project in terms of kind of we now have outcomes from that last year to see folks who have who have been at that site, how long have they stayed there and, and what proportion have moved into permanent housing. And they've had a lot of residents successfully move into permanent housing through that process. So um, the city in the last few months went through a project called Operation Safe Shelter, which sort of looked at that continuum of shelter options, um, identified where the gaps are and scoped out kind of what are some options for, for additional spaces. One is the the sort of authorized campsite, which is a lower service site, but just sort of a space where folks can go and camp and get some connection with service providers. The, the temporary safe outdoor space is sort of the next step on that continuum. And it would be, um, they're talking about increasing it to uh, a few more sites and having more of um, hard sided structures to, and, and again, in that really service rich environment, that one is, is not as well defined yet. I don't know what that next location is or what that model will look like. Um, the city and county staff have really been focused on that, the safe campsite first, and then we'll kind of move on to that next step in the spectrum. But, but all of that work is really intended to, again, look at that spectrum of, of shelter options that we have in the community, identify the gaps, and make sure that we've got an option for each of our residents who is unhoused and maybe living on the street currently, finding a, a spot that will work for them. That was great. Thank you, Montana. We have another really good question from Molly. Molly, if you wanna go ahead and unmute and just ask your question, that would be fine. Okay, I have to figure that out. Sorry, guys. And forgive the the woodpecker. That's just <laughs> my little mascot for today. So I'm just sort of struck by how, like, it feels like this need is so immediate. And yet a lot of the solutions that we're talking about, especially when we're talking about housing versus homelessness, it's kind of long-term policy stuff. And it feels like for me, I don't know what steps to take first, right? What, um, how can I have an impact on this huge issue in a, both immediately and long-term? Well, a couple of things to think about. One is, um, you know, building the supply is the problem. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's really a supply issue. And unfortunately, building new takes, you know, at least, you know, 18 months. Um, but one way to start is looking at what projects are coming forward through the city process and making sure that um, high density quality rental housing is getting the support it needs. Um, Kaya shared an interesting resource that will um, see at the end here about um, the number of people who come out to oppose or preserve their neighborhood at um, community meetings. And policymakers really need to hear from people who understand the problem and are willing to have um, density and affordable housing in their backyard. And really maybe even taking it a step further and asking policymakers to say, okay, well, this is a great project. How many of these units are affordable and can um, be used to rehouse families? and starting that conversation um, amongst the broader community and the development community to help them understand what their obligation is as they um, bring development to Missoula. Um, it's a, it is a long-term problem because it's you know, 18 months and the, the, the need is immediate. But I'm also fairly confident that Montana is looking at probably what existing inventory is out there and what unique re-adaptive re uses can be looked at for immediate needs. Um, we all know that the way we use land and use buildings has really changed a lot and continuing to change. So where are those immediate wins that could possibly be um, a six to nine month solution rather than an 18 month solution as far as increasing inventory? Um, so, you know, the advocacy piece is it sounds trite, but it is so critical for your civic leaders to understand that um, we know the trade offs. We're going to invest in keeping Missoula, the things about Missoula that everybody loves, but we also know that we have to increase inventory and that means density in the right places and good planning. The other thing I would add is, um, is making sure that you're finding ways to keep people in their homes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
where is that place that we can funnel the rental assistance so that we're preventing the problem from getting larger? Or how do we keep people in their homes? Because we know that is much less expensive and has much less trauma and much less impact on the community than people losing their homes. So making sure that um, the folks who are responsible for helping keeping people in their homes have the resources that they need to be flexible in helping keeping people there. Yeah, that was, that's one of the things we've been thinking about. And Molly, I love your question because we know we have to think about the immediate needs and the long-term at the same time. We have to be doing both. Um, and what we've seen during COVID is we've had to really shift to the immediate needs. And that's not been our historic, that's not the place we've operated historically. Historically, we've been looking at you know, planning and long-range support for clients and um, long-range policy and um, the, the current moment really does demand that we have some immediate solutions. And I think there are resources for that. Um, and I, I love the way you responded, Andy, about what an individual can do and what a local community can do to really try to move things efficiently and effectively and support those projects that are already trying to get off the ground. And Kaya, I would, I would just add kind of relative to that, just taking a moment to think about your own sphere of influence in the community and then the housing market, whether it is being able to go and advocate for a project, or if you are a landlord, um, thinking about kind of what your priorities are in, in your own rental properties and how you manage them. And can you partner with one of these organizations to make your unit available to a, a, fa a family um, exiting homelessness? Uh, there's, there's a lot of of kind of room to impact the market. And again, Andy said earlier, you know, we're, this is a small community. So those individual choices really matter. If you're thinking about selling your home, can you um, give a priority to a local family? Or, you know, there's lots of ways to impact the market at your own individual decision level. All right, thank you guys. We do have a couple more really Great questions. I know we're getting up there on 1210, um, but I want to ask these two questions and then you guys can feel free to answer whichever or however you choose. So our first question is from uh, Marcy. Marcy says, how do we integrate affordable housing across the community, not just in the high poverty neighborhoods? Those neighborhoods are, are already strained. And the second question is, can you elaborate on the connection between short-term Airbnb rentals and housing scarcity and high housing prices? And what are some creative models to leverage those to raise money to address the issues? So go ahead and take, take on whichever of those two questions you feel like taking. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I think Marcy's question relates really well to the conversation we were just having, right? About our sphere of like Montana said, our sphere of influence. And this, this one's really personal to me too. I live in the Franklin to Fort neighborhood in Missoula, which is a neighborhood that's zoned for density. I know Marcy lives on the north side. <laughs> um, so we, we both live in communities that are seeing this development pressure and the pressure for low-income housing. Oh, west side, thanks. Oh, Montana's on the west side. Yeah, so we all live in these neighborhoods where we're seeing this change. Um, and I think for me, the most important thing is we need a yes and. So I need to continue to advocate for more density and more solutions in my neighborhood. And I need to see the neighborhoods that aren't doing that, doing that. So I need to see the U District and the South Side and the Rattlesnake and all of these neighborhoods um, taking, that, taking on density where it makes sense. Um, so that we're, we are spreading that out, but we're also not just saying, no, I'm done because we, we need it everywhere. So that's a, that's a zoning issue. And the city is gonna be taking on comprehensive zoning. And um, there's a really great New York Times op-ed. The title is something like, if you care about social justice, you should care about zoning. Um, and you could say the same for, if you care about climate change, you should care about zoning. If you care about racial equity, you should care about zoning. So um, we should all care about zoning. <laughs> we'll take any support we can get on our comprehensive code reform project. I'll say that it's gonna be a few years of work, but um, I think it'll be really important to implementing our overall housing policy goals, as well as a lot of other city adopted goals. 
Well, it sounds like you um, have a bit of a heavy lift. Um, so it really is that sphere of influence and in making sure that you do um, have that support in the room when you start to have these really difficult and contentious conversations, because there's a lot that can be accomplished through zoning um, first. And you know you can go so far. I mean, there are communities all over the country that have inclusionary zoning policies that set, that that regulates in a in a way that's probably a little bit less comfortable than a lot of Montanans would be okay with, which is says that if you're going to put in 50 homes, five of them will be affordable. Um, or if you're going to put in a large new subdivision, then you have to have so many multifamily affordable rentals. And that is a next level regulation that can sometimes have some unintended consequences to cost. So it, it's sort of a, there needs to be a delicate balance between, you know, carrot and stick. And there, are, I'm sure that Montana, you have great people on your team that are looking at policies all over the country to sort of pick the best ones that fit for the community and that you feel are um, palatable to the community that can really get this done. But on a short term, um, you know, with the ADU policy that you have there in Missoula, I mean, people can choose um, to help um, the housing inventory by um, providing an ADU in their own on their own property and then choosing very carefully who they rent it to. And um, Montana, I really like what you said about, you know, making those individual choices because in a small community, it really does matter. And um, you know, there's stories all over um, the Boise area where you have people putting up signs in their yard that say, sell me a house. I'm, my wife is pregnant and we, you know, we're not looking for a downgrade. We're just looking for an opportunity because everyone's getting out bid. And so it's really um, individual choices matter who you sell to, who you rent to, making those choices and um, taking on that risk to be able to help solve the problem and know that the support network is there. Um, I'm certain that you have organizations in Missoula that will support you should you have a problem like, okay, I'm willing to take this risk and not just rent to the most qualified buyer, but I'm willing to take a risk with someone who was previously homeless or has an eviction on their record and who knows what those circumstances are and di diving a little bit deeper to um, why that person needs a place to live and making that individual choice. So there's a lot of ways to, to make sure that we bring that density into those um, areas and the zoning is, is your first level, obviously. Um, but maybe adaptive reuse also. I mean, what are the, the things that might already be there? Are, is there you know, existing commercial buildings that might allow for a conversion to multifamily housing without the new comprehensive zoning changes? Um, and what are those opportunities to put density in those areas that might be more commercial along those um, more traditionally single family neighborhoods? Wow, this has been such an educational and interesting topic. I wish we could sit here and chat with all of these lovely ladies for the rest of the afternoon. I'm sure that you guys could just fill our ears with so much great content. So thank you guys for the great information. Um, Kaya, thank you so much for moderating. Um, I do want to mention, I have a ton of resources that all three of these lovely women have supplied us with. I will send an email to everybody that has those resources included. But in closing, if any of you wanted to touch on any of the specific resources you sent um, and, and tell our attendees to keep an eye out on those, um, I'm gonna quickly put that screen up there. <clears throat> and again, thank you guys for your time today. Ladies, are there any of these that we should specifically be focusing on after today's wonderful conversation? Andy. Sorry, I was I was responding to um, Kathy's question on the Airbnb is to let her know that I'd be happy to talk offline um, if she wants to talk more about Airbnb um, and, and what we can do because you can tax them. Um, so the only thing I would ref um, I reference the um, the increase of the affordable housing tax credit, it really is a bipartisan um, bill and it's currently, I mean, it, it, it might seem like long-term policy advocacy, but if it can get into the reconciliation bill, it can bring uh, resources for supply very, very quickly. And because everyone knows that the housing crisis is so critical, I'm certain um, that those in charge of the distribution of low-income housing tax credit the state of Montana will get those into people's hands as quickly as possible. So um, feel free to reach out to your congressional delegation and let them know that um, even um, Senator Mike Crapo from Idaho is on board. <laughs> so um, 
it's okay to support affordable housing and it is a bipartisan partnership. So um, it's a simple one. It will increase supply and it matters. And if they can keep it into that reconciliation bill and get that passed, it'll, it'll happen real fast. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Kaya Peterson, Andy Clark, Montana James. This has been absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And thank you to the Missoula Community Foundation and Nikki Robb for hosting us today. This will be so. has been recorded and it will be available on YouTube and Nikki will send out that link and it will also be on our website. Thank you all. Thanks for thank having you. me. Thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Thanks. Nikki.